Hello everyone, I'm Mike Kanichi, and today on Valley Sports, I'm very delighted. We have a former Derby Red Raider as well as a Derby coach, Dan Shea. Just to give you a little background on Dan Shea, he was a two-way starter for Derby's 1985 state championship team. He was also All-State that year, as well as a captain for that team. But Dan, after high school, took his career to another level and for 25 years, he was a Pop Warner coach for various programs in the Pop Warner level. And there was one year in 1995 that many Derby residents remember. He took that magical team to the Super Bowl in 1995. And Dan, it's, I'm delighted to have you on today. Thank you for coming on. It's definitely a pleasure. Thanks, Mike. It's a real honor to be here. Thanks. Now, Dan, let me ask you, you got out of high school in 1986. Did you know when... You were graduating that year that you wanted to coach that fall of Pop Warner, or did it kind of just happen by accident? I actually think it happened by accident. I um, I really didn't didn't think about it much, right? Although I kind of you know idolized my coaches and uh, loved what they did for us. Um, it didn't really hit me until just there was just one afternoon I was at a, a derby, the girls' softball game. And ran into a couple of the guys that were on the board, uh, Nick Rizzio and uh, Mo Monahan. Right. And we just started talking about it. And they're like, listen, we have a meeting coming up next week. Why don't you come? And I said, okay. And uh, that was it. <laughs> now, one of the things that happens to a lot of former players is that first year out of high school, it's tough to, you know, walk away from it. You definitely get, you miss it. You know, when you go to the games, you kind of, you know, you feel left out because now you know your time is done. So, I mean, do you think that played into you wanting a coach because you just wanted to continue to be around it? I think it did. Um, it was really – it was tough. I remember going to the uh, – I went to some of the spring practices right the year after, and then I went to the, the scrimmages, and I was like – it was weird not being out there. But coaching kind of kind of helped relieve that a little bit. You know? right. So I knew I was still part of it. Right. And now let me ask you, you get out of high school. I mean, I'm sure like a lot of kids when they first get out, you know, they don't really know what they're going to do 10 years from now. But you, you miss it so much that you think you want to coach at some level. I mean, did you think you wanted to coach with the high school down the road, like in a couple of years or you really didn't have an idea? I really didn't. Um, with um as as years went on the, with my work schedule, I knew that coaching high school probably was never going to be a reality. Right. Um, although, you know, George French gives me a call every year asking <laughs> me <laughs> if I'm available, and every year I unfortunately got to say no. But um, it. Uh, but I have no regrets. I mean, I, I love working with the little kids. Right. So your first year is 1986. Uh, what division did you coach that year? I coached the Pee Wees. Pee Wees. Yeah. yeah. And now, who was the head coach at the time? It was uh, Eddie Traz. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. He was our head coach. And uh, Steve Kazarka was right. our offensive coordinator. And I coached with uh, uh, Jimmy Butler, who was right. also a uh, coach that year. And now, did you work with the line that year? Or? I did. Yeah. Yeah. We did the line, uh, me and Jimmy. And uh, Steve did the backs, and you know, he ran the offense. And, and, and I actually ran the defense. Right. So let me ask you this, though. That's a tough age group to coach because, I mean, in a lot of ways, I don't even know if Mighty Mites had existed yet. So in a lot of ways, that's their introduction to football. Did you find yourself having to be very patient with kids that age? I mean, you know, they're still young kids and trying to teach them plays and stuff. That's not always easy. Yeah, we, we did, especially that team. Um, and we had nine-year-olds on that team who, right. who've never played before. And you're right, Mighty Mites were not uh, in existence yet. And we had some great athletes on that team. Uh, David Ann Roman was one of right. our, one of our players, and uh, uh, so you had to be careful with the nine year olds because you wanted them to progress and you wanted them to grow. You knew they were the future, and you don't want to you don't want to turn them off at, at at a young age. So you had really had to you know nurture them along. Right. So now you coached that first season. Did you know after that season ended that you wanted to continue to do this? Did you like it right off the bat? I did. It, um, well, we had a lot of success right off the bat. Um, that team uh, 
we were, uh, I think we were 8-0-1 oh, wow. that year. And we ended up, we won the Southern Connecticut that year. And then we went to Methuen to play for the New England Championship. Back then, you just, you won, once you won the Southern, you went right to New England's. Right. And we, we got beat up in Massachusetts. But, so it was, it was, uh, it was addicting. Right. You know, it was so much fun working with the kids and, and, and seeing them progress. And, and we, again, having success right off the bat, um, we beat Ansonia twice that year. Right. Um, our only tie was to Trumbull. And uh, so, you know, I took it year by year, but I had a feeling I'd be there for a while. Right. And when you're coaching that level, to you, what is the biggest challenge for you? To What do you look for the most out of coaching those kids? I mean, yes, you want to get wins, but, I mean, is it X's and O's or is it more teaching them, you know, the art of football? It, it It's a lot of that. It's But I, – I've always been a believer in in the fundamentals, um, right? You know, really just teaching them because the, again, some of them never played before. There's right. been many years where we had many you know first year players, but um, with Steve Kazarka and myself, we we were able to teach the kids a lot and run a whole bunch of different formations, a whole bunch of di- different defensive fronts. But we taught it slowly. We made it part of practice, so it made it easier. Right. Um, but the fundamentals, if you don't have that, forget it. Right. And you know what was fun to watch a lot is when Derby would be playing on a Friday night, a lot of those kids would be coming down the hill from practice. And, right. I mean, those kids really loved football. You know, and that's that's not easy because when you're 9, 10 years old trying to get them to focus and, you know, a lot of kids don't want to go to practice and stuff. But it seemed like those type of kids back then really loved going to football practice all the time. Yeah, they did. that. You know, there was still, um, you know, um, Derby had a, just still a great winning program. And, and those kids, you know, they, um, you know, I think they had aspirations of, of being out there themselves, right. you know. So I remember one year, uh, you know, the kids, you'd ask them what numbers they wanted. And I remember one year, one of the kids said, I, I want number 54. A lot of a lot of kids wanted like 56, Lawrence Taylor, right. numbers like that. So I, one kid said, I want 54. So I was trying to think, who's 54? And he goes, well, that's Mark Angeletti. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, okay. So, yeah, that's pretty cool, yeah. you know, that they uh, idolize the high yeah. school kid. Yep. So now, when did you first become a head coach, and what level was that? I didn't. I became head coach in 94. Oh, so the first year of the team, yeah. Yeah, so 94 was um, I had broken off from the Pee Wees. And uh, so, yeah, I became the head coach of the junior midget team right. that year. Yeah. So now, before we get into that, I, if I do recall, after the 92 season, you decided to move up and you coached the freshman team with Jay Bonanto and um, Dave Chevarello and those guys. Um, but you went back to Pop Warner a year later. Was it just something you missed Pop Warner? Or? Um, I did. Um, in fact, I worked with... Um, um, I had taken a semester off a of school, and I worked with um, Steve Kazarka, right. and he was, he he gave me the opportunity to you know to get out of work early and go to freshman practice. Right. So I so I you know um, I I took advantage of that that opportunity, but um, you know that didn't that didn't last long. And again, I had a normal work schedule, so I had to go back to Pop Warner. Right. So now ninety four, you become a head coach, and I believe you coached the junior midgets that year, correct? I did, yeah. right? And that team almost made it to the championship. I think it was like a heartbreaking loss on a Saturday afternoon. Yep, I, I can't recall the team, but yeah, it was a good team. I think we were, um, I think we finished like eight and two that year. It right, was a good team. But you had a lot of the players that you would have on that ninety five team, correct? Or yeah, a good amount. A good amount, yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, you kind of. Talk about, let's get into 95 now. I mean, when the season started, I mean, what goal did you really have? I mean, did you look at this team and said to yourself, you know, we could go all the way? I mean, did you have a goal set for this team? Yeah, you know, every year we'd ask the kids, you know, what, what's your goal? And, um, you know, we, we didn't want to make the goal. We wanted the kids to, you know, right. self-discover a little bit and, you know, decide for themselves. And, and they they were like, we want to win the, the Southern Connecticut Championship. And... um so and that's usually that was the that was always the goal, you know. Right. Now, as a Pop Warner coach, I mean, you definitely would know better than me. 
it you really can't scout teams in Pop Warner. I mean, aren't you, you guys for the most part are playing on the same day? So I mean, what is the toughest thing like trying to prepare for teams when you definitely aren't able to go out and watch them? Yeah, it's um it's a funny thing in in, in Derby back in '95. You know, having lights, we had a lot of Saturday night games. Right. So it was it was good in a way cuz now we're not playing on the on Sundays when most teams are playing pop war so we were able to go scout a lot of teams on the opposite side a lot of those teams were able to scout us too because we were right. the only team playing on Saturday night so um so you know we we did scouting you know it wasn't um it wasn't like it is today you know now they're, right. they're all sitting in the the bleachers with video cameras and things like that and it's legal and you can do it right. but um back then so we we did some scouting um but not not a real whole whole lot. Right. Valley so teams you basically definitely. just had to, you know, kind of have an idea what they ran right. and yep. hope it worked and yep. stuff like that. So you know the season begins and right off the bat, I mean, talk about your defense a little bit because your defense, if I'm not mistaken, especially the first team defense, they didn't give up a single point till maybe week eleven, if I'm correct. Yeah, um, yeah, we had uh, our our first our first game. Um, in the fourth quarter, we were winning pretty handily, and we put the young kids in, and they gave up two touchdowns. But after that, um, we end up we had ten shutouts in a row. Right. Um, we had uh, a little similar to your nineteen eighty five uh, varsity team. Yeah, you guys shut out a yeah, lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we. Uh, it, it was funny, Coach Desenzo. I remember in the eighty six when I was. Uh, when I was getting ready to coach my first game, I figured I was going to go talk to him and and maybe give me some pointers, you know. So I went down after practice, and uh, so he's just getting ready to. He they just finished varsity practice, and he was about to go up the stairs. And I said, Coach, I said, uh, Listen, I'm going about to call my first uh, defensive game uh, this weekend. I go, You got any any advice? So I thought he'd bring me upstairs, maybe go over some X's and O's. He put his hand on my shoulder and goes, Dan, don't let him score. <laughs> <laughs> and he ran up the stairs, and I said, <laughs> and I was like, "That's it." But afterwards, I realized, you know what? That works. If right. we score, we're gonna win. <laughs> right. So now, talk about. Let's talk about that team a little bit. Um, you had a real good backfield. I mean, you had Mark Tilkey, and you played with his brother John, I believe, on yep. the '85 team. So he had Mark Tilkey, and I believe he had 23 or 24 touchdowns that year. And you also had it a real tough kid in the name of uh, Jeff Boyle who, you know, if Mark couldn't get to the outside, you could always run on the inside with uh, Jeff. Talk about that backfield. Yeah. Those two, um, it was amazing. Um, Mark was, Mark was so fast and so small at the same time. I mean, back then the, the, he was at the the limit for an older lighter was 80 pounds. So he was, you know, he was, he was little, but he was incredibly fast. He had incredible balance. Uh, right. he, again, being little, he would get knocked around a bit, but he, somehow he'd always be able to uh, keep his balance. And once he got in the open field, he, he, was, he was gone. He was just so fast. And then with Jeff, Jeff was our thumper. Um, and he was quick, too. Um, right. You know, he had, um, I can't even imagine how many yards after contact he would have had because hardly anybody took him down one on one. It was usually took a couple of kids, and uh, he was just a hard nosed runner. If we needed two or three yards, you know, we know we would give him the ball. Right, and you also had a good quarterback in a DJ Manning, correct? I mean, he he could throw the ball, which you know at that age it's unusual to do it a lot, but you guys were able to do it. Yeah, he um, he he really did. He did some of the th- little things really well. He did a lot of um. You know, the like we did a lot of play action passes where he'd fake the the dive up the middle and then hit our tight end, or hit a, a long um, you know curling snake. But but he did a great job with that, um, being able to hide the ball, and um, he did a really good job. One of our favorite plays was a curling snake, and he would fake the curl, and then pump it and then hit the, right. the snake, and um, so he really did a good job. He rarely made mistakes. Right. And, you know, you talk about that great backfield, but a backfield is only as good as its offensive line. Talk about the uh, linemen and how big they were for that team that year. Um, big in heart. Right. Uh, big as, as an important, right? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's um, they were they were they were it was a good line. They were um, they worked really hard at it. And um, 
you know, I think again the the, the fundamentals. Uh, we right. did um, we did a drill a drill called Bird Dog every single day, and it was you know you get in your stance, you take one step, you take one step, then you take two steps, and we did that every single day. Um, I remember going the year before. Um, going to see Notre Dame play Navy at the Meadowlands. Right. And I was just watching their warm-ups, and I'm looking at Notre Dame in the end zone, and they're doing bird dog. And I was like, wow, hey, if they can do it, and they're the best linemen in the country, we could do it. So we did it every single day. And the kids never complained. It was it was boring. Right. You know, because it was just repetition, repetition. And um, and we did a lot of hitting. Um, they they weren't afraid of contact. And um, they, just, they just really, they really did a good job. And some of those kids, like, Andrew Backlick, who right. was probably the second fastest kid on our team, he was our center. Right. So and, they were also very. And he uns- would go on to be a running back in he high would. school. Yeah. yeah. So. So they were very unselfish. Right. Kids too, because any one of them probably could have been a, a fullback or you know running back, but um, but they were just a, just a good good group, and they really bought into the fact that they were the line. Right. You know, they knew that Tilkey was getting the headlines, Boyles, DJ, and a couple of other kids, but they they knew that that they wouldn't be there if it wasn't for them, and they they bought into that. So it's hard to get eleven and twelve year old kids right. to do that. So it was a unique group. Right, and you also had a very good coaching staff that year. I think uh, Sean Monahan called the uh, offense. Yep. You called the defense, and yep. there was a couple other c- coaches on that team as well. Yep. I mean. It, it helps to have a good coach and staff, or it doesn't work. Yeah, it, it, one of the things that, that I've loved about coaching so long is 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 the the bond I've had with the coaches. We've had such right. a good time coaching with each other. Um, yeah, so Sean was our offensive coordinator, and um, you know he was old school. His dad coached, um, loved right. loved the wishbone, loved going you know unbalanced, uh, but um, he mixed it up uh, as well. He did just a really great job and. What I always liked about Sean and, and some of the other coaches I've coached with is they, they did a great job of, you know, you have your first string backs. And usually it's a step backwards a little bit when you have to put your second string. But not with this team. This team, with Sean, he, he kept them busy. He kept them really part of the uh, practice, and they, they knew what they had to do. Um, so he, re- he really did a great job. And then, um, yeah, we had John Bittman. Yeah. And, um, uh his son Sean helped us out every now and then when he was home from school. Right. And uh, and then Greg Maliska um right. he coached as well. Right. Yeah. So I mean and those were guys not too far out of high school yet either. Right. So it's good I think oh, it's and Rick good. Kovacs too. Almost right. forgot Rick. Can't yeah, I think it's a good it's good to have a mix of some who just got out, some who've been out. Um you know, the thing that was special about that team too is I think it gave the Derby fan hope because at the time Derby had just come off a second straight losing season, you know, the varsity. Yeah. And I, you know, people really didn't know where the program was headed, but that team, I think that year gave that town a lot of life because, you know, it was another disappointing varsity football season. And that team really, you know, everybody was following that team. You know, what game would you say? Does, is there a game that stands out where you said, you know what, guys? We got something here, you know. I I could see us really running the table. It was. It was funny because I, I actually kept waiting for the season to end. Right. Um, we had, you know, in, through previous years, we had gone to uh, we had won the Southern Connecticut Championship, and then, and then we had gone on to um, like the the Connecticut regionals or. Um, New England regionals, and we'd always end up playing Danbury. Yeah. And as great a season we would have in the Southern Connecticut, we'd go up and play Danbury, and we would get thumped right. every year. So, and it was funny. So we played Danbury. No one scored on us in 10 games. They marched right down. They opened the opening kickoff. They marched right down the field, and they score on us. And right. in the back of my head, I'm going, okay, here we go. And that was it. That was the only points they scored. We ended up winning that game, I think, 20-6. to six. So, but at, I knew we had a special group of kids, but I, I, again, I kept waiting for us to, you know, get either outclassed or just, you know, right. outgunned. And um, so you yeah. never really looked ahead. You kind of took it game by game. You, yeah. You know. Yep. Yeah. Because again, as you progress on, the, the, the talent becomes, you know, even better. So, and like I said, I haven't been there many times in the past. Um, 
you know, getting that rude awakening when you get into you know, right. that kind of um, playoff atmosphere. It's, it was it was tough. So, you know, when I had um, Charlie Desenzo on the TV show, one of the things he said to me about his 90 state championship team is he said, sometimes your best year is your most stressful year. It's your most difficult year. Let me ask you as a coach, did you enjoy that season or was it hard to enjoy it because you know you're thinking about oh now we're five and oh we got to be six and oh you know were you at work a lot thinking about that team and things like that i mean did you go home stressed a lot i mean did you enjoy that year or we we did we enjoyed it um there was always something to keep us you know motivated right um you know we got to the i think the last game of the year and now we're playing ansonia and um, so, you know, it doesn't take much to get up for that game. That was uh, right. still very did you play intense. Them? Where did you play that game at? The f- uh, first time we played, we played them twice that year. We played them in Derby the first time. And uh, that was, you know, it was a really intense game. Um, right. Like the rivalry was still intense. The kids um, really, you know, uh, still enjoyed that rivalry. Um, right. And then, so now we're, after that game, we now we're going into the Southern Connecticut playoff, so now you know we're we're motivated for that, and um, so it wasn't hard. It, it was it was a, it was as far as stressful. It was um, there was really no stress, right? Uh, you know, nothing negative. You know, right? It was all positive, right? I think I mean by the stress though, like did you just was it constantly on your mind? But I mean, were you more excited than like uh, worried what could happen? Or I mean. Because that was a great year, and, you know, as you guys, as people could see what, you know, was happening with this team, I mean, I'm sure, like, you know, you were getting a lot of phone calls from friends and stuff like that, talking to you about the team, and, yeah. you know. Yeah, I always, no, no matter what game, I always would get butterflies. Even right. up to the, the last game I coached a few years ago, I would still get butterflies before the game. And um, and you're right, that stress level was was getting, you know, more and more. Um, I remember we had to play Greenfield, Massachusetts on a Wednesday and it was, it was freezing. At, uh, we had to go up there at night and, um, I remember watching them warm up and Sean and I were looking and we we're watching their quarterback throw the ball like 50 yards in the air. And we was like, oh boy, <laughs> wow. here we go. And, um, so, uh, that was, yeah, we ended up winning that game actually pretty easily. They, um, but again, now, now you're going you know, you got to play a few days later in Rhode Island, and right. and the stress. You're right; the stress did build up um, with with each game. You know, but um, it's stress. I'll I'll, I'll welcome any time we right. playing those kind of games. Exactly. Now, before we get further into that team, as a guy who won a championship as a player and a guy who won one as a coach, you know, you'll hear a lot of people say you can't compare when you win it as a player. But when you're working with these little kids, you know, every day and things like that, I mean, can you compare the two a little? I mean, which one is more special or are they both kind of the same? They're both unique in their own way. I think they, they are both unique in their own way. Um, you know, my, my, my friends from 85, you know, we, we're still great friends today. Right. We see each other all the time and we talk about the season and, you know, our football career. Um, but one of the nice things of coaching is, is you know, now I, I see these kids. You know, we've had you know some great teams through the years, and I, I see the kids now. You know, ten, fifteen, twenty, now thirty years later. Right. They still call me coach, which yeah. makes me feel great. I right. love that. Um, but we can talk about so many different memories. Not only the '95 team, but you know, I even go back to David and Roman's team in '86. Right. Um, and. Uh, so it's 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 just special, you know, to watch the kids grow up and go on to play. Um, you know, we had um, I think it was um, Mike Pake went on to play at Yale. Right. Went to see a few of his game. Mark Tilke went on to play at Tufts. Went up to see him play. So that that kind of thing just lasts for so long, and it's it's it's, it's really special when you watch those kids just grow up from Pop Warner kids. Now you watch them on the on the on the high school field being successful and being successful in, in, in life. And right. It's great. And the thing is about coaching pop Warner is when they get to the high school level, those high school coaches expect that they know how to tackle. They know how to block. They know how to do all these form things. It really has to start at pop Warner. So, I mean, basically to me, that's the toughest part of any coach's job in pop Warner is 
you have to make sure you're teaching these kids the proper way to do things because when you get to the high school level, those high school coaches really can't teach that. You know, I mean, they don't, they really can't spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, it's, it's, that was the thing, like you said earlier about, you know, it's nice to get the wins. Um, but as a Pop Warner coach, you know, you're there to, to teach the kids, you teach the game. Um, and, um, and that's, that's what we try to do. Right. So now I'll never forget it. Derby loses to Shelton on Thanksgiving and, you know, everybody's pretty down in the dumps. It's Mm -hmm. second straight year of a losing season, which was really unheard of in Derby. I mean, one thing about Derby, they were known for always having a winning season every Mm -hmm. year. Now you got back to back losing seasons. You guys, I believe, played that Saturday afternoon in West Haven, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah right. It and it was against, uh, God, what's the name of the team? PBD. Right. Talk about that game because, you know, when you guys won that game, I will never forget driving home and just seeing so many cars lined up, beeping the horns. I mean, that was surreal. That was awesome. Yeah. The whole, the whole, um, even the lead up to that game was, uh, you know, I was, I think I was 27 years old then, and my wife and I had just gotten married. And, uh, so that was a stressful time. (laughs) (laughs) And then, uh, so they had a big meeting at the Holiday Inn down in New Haven and, uh, to discuss the, the game and, you know, what, who would be the home team, what color shirts we'd wear and this and that. And, and these guys, the coaches from Peabody, they come in with their national championship jackets. Apparently I didn't realize at the time, but they were, back-to-back national champions wow so i find out at this meeting that we're playing a you know two-time national champion so yeah that stress level then was <laughs> you <laughs> right. know i remember sitting next to jimmy moscola and he put his arm he's like, it's gonna be okay it's gonna be okay i was like okay so um yeah so we go go to west haven and um you know they 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 were there um they saw us getting off the bus uh, and they were actually laughing at our kids because we were so little Wow. And um, so the um, the nice thing about playing that game in West Haven was it was kind of a home game, you know, for us. Right. All the all the other games, we had to play Danbury in Danbury. We had to play Greenfield Mass in Greenfield Mass. We played Middletown, Rhode Island. Yeah, you never had a home Rhode game. Middletown, Rhode Island, right. We right. played on their field. Um, but this was, our, this was our, our home game. And... Um, the amount of people that were there was just it was it was mind boggling it I remember going out for a a timeout we were so caught up in the game we really weren't paying attention um the only thing I made sure was i always always looked for my dad right my dad always came to the game, so i'd always the the one time I'd break free mentally from the game is just to look in the stand to see if my dad is there right right so he was always there but I remember coming off the field, I forget, it was maybe toward the end of the game, and I looked up in the stands, I was walking off with Sean, I was like, and there was 2,000 people in the stands. Yeah, it was crazy. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. The stands in West Haven was absolutely filled. And then, um, you know, then we win that game, and then you're right, coming home on Route 34, they had um, they had the fire trucks meet us, and yeah. we had a, an escort going into town, and uh, that that you know, no, no, we, we didn't expect that, you know? Right. Uh, it was, it was unbelievable. And how good of a feeling was it to have, because I know Charlie DeCenzo was at that game. I think all the Derby coaches were Johnny Oko, Ronnie Leno, yep. John D. Francisco. But how good of a feeling was it to see a guy that was your coach mm-hmm. watching you coach, you know, and he's at that game and he's joining that crowd, you know, on the yeah. way home. That had to be a great feeling. It was. In fact, um, a few days later in the mail, I had gotten a card from Coach Asenzo. Right. And it's, it's, and I, it, and I bet you I, still I, have I it. I still right? have it. Yeah. And yeah. I see it all the time when I, every time I'm going through my memorabilia stuff. And it just said, great, great job, great game. You made me smile. Right. And um, I, I get goosebumps now thinking about it. So it meant a lot because, you know, you know what he meant to me. So, right. So now you guys get off that bus, you know. You come back to the field house. What was that feeling like just getting off the bus? And, I mean, you got all these people supporting you. I mean, I I would think, you know, as good a feeling as it is for you is coaching those kids all year, getting to see them be treated like rock stars had to be a great feeling for you just to see them take it all in. I was just going to say it was it was almost like we were like celebrities. It was, it was, it was amazing um, that we were, you know, going to Florida. 
You know, right. We're um, winning a game that, you know, I, when I saw how big that team was, I was like, oh, my God. And uh, But, yeah, the fact that we were now going to Florida, and, um, you know, and that didn't happen very often back then. Right. You know, going to Florida. Now, you know, our cheerleaders. Um, and I see, believe you had to play another game in between, right, before that Super Bowl. Wasn't there one oh, yeah. more? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. kind of like a Final Four. Yeah. Right. But so, be- before we talk about the whole Florida, you know, the Final Four and stuff, mm-hmm. going to Florida is not easy. You see today, you know, whenever these cheerleaders have to go and raise mm-hmm. money for stuff, they have to fundraise like crazy. Yeah. Talk about the fundraising aspect and just talk about the support you got from the parents because it seemed like the parents really supported you guys throughout the whole season. We had an amazing group of parents. A lot of coaches today, you know, say that the reason they don't want to coach is because, you know, the parents get too involved. We were blessed with the the best group of parents, um, the Tilkey family, the Mannings, the Connerys, the Bartones. Um, it was Absolutely amazing. Backlick, Steve Giovanni's. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna leave somebody out, but they were they were it was um it was absolutely amazing the support we got from them. Um and it was a huge undertaking going right. to Florida because again we had never done that. You know, nowadays, you know, the girls, the cheerleaders, you know, Melanie and, and Ronnie, they, they have it down to a science, you know, because they, <laughs> right. they're pretty much they they know they're going every year and they work hard for it. But that year in 95 we had never you know right had anything like that so it was new for us so so we knew we had to raise money we had to raise it fast right and um it was it's it was mind-blowing how fast money came in we were getting money everywhere the city gave us 10 grand right okay um we did a boot drive that next weekend or it might have been even on that sunday Right. They organized it right away, and they raised five thousand dollars in that one wow. day on it's the crazy. food drive. And um, but then the the money that came in from businesses was it was unbelievable. Um, I believe I may not have the number right, but I believe we raised almost forty thousand dollars in ten days. And you know was, the thing to keep in mind is this was right around you know the holidays. Christmas was coming and stuff. So I mean you know you, you don't always get good donations at that time. So I mean just really right. shows what the town you know the town still is a great town i mean it proved it during that time yeah it did and it's um you know i, I laugh all the time you know I, I live in seymour now but my heart will always bleed red in derby and it, you know and it, and it's because of that team the 95 team not not the 85 state championship team it was our that 95 team the support we got from the city was unbelievable. I mean, we came home from Florida. They had a parade for us, and it, right. it was it was amazing. And like I said, you know, we didn't pay for anything, and you that's know, the important thing, right. too. I mean, the coaches, the kids, flight, room, um, and we had to pay for food, and that was about it. And you know, that takes a load off everybody because if you know, you guys are thinking about what can we do to win the game. You got to think about what you have to do to get to the game, and mm-hmm. once you had that first headache got it away, yeah. I'm sure you were able to relax and just focus yeah, on. Yeah, that was that was a nice thing with the the group we had um, in Derby the, on our board that year, Pop Warner. They they took care of everything. Um, I was not involved with trying to coordinate money or you know hotel rooms, flights, things like that. They took care of everything. Right. So which was which was kind of nice. You know, it really let us, it really allowed us to really kind of just enjoy the 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 moment, you know. And um, you know, the the team that we played, the first team we played, we didn't see them until we stepped on the field. Right. You know, we didn't know anything about them. So we just got to enjoy the whole the whole the whole part of it, you know. Right. We, the flight, we all went on the same plane down together. It was it was a lot of fun. Right. And the kids must have loved it. I mean, they are 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. I mean, so you're talking 11, 12, and 13-year-olds. So, I mean, it just had to be like, you know, it's almost, I could compare it almost to the Trumbull team that won the Little League World Series because that's basically the same way this team was kind of treated, you know, and looked at. I mean, it was just an unbelievable time. I use that comparison all the time Yeah, the Trumbull team. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, I remember them. They're, you know, I think the Red Sox and Yankees both had them in their booth, you know, talking mm-hmm. to them. And I mean, right. this team, you know, everybody had heard about this team. You know, you had people in Shelton who were actually mm-hmm. rooting for Derby. I mean, right. which I thought was great. They just wanted to see the Valley 
you know, do yeah. good, which I mean, you know. we were on every every media outlet there was. We were on um every TV station. We were in all the newspapers. It it was the the, the amount of media coverage and could you imagine if there was streaming back then, oh. people would have been able to watch the game, you know, from because right. a lot of people flew up to that game. If I'm not mistaken, your father, Sean Monahan's father, they flew up for the game to watch. I mean, yeah. people wanted to see the game. We you know? all, it, it's amazing. Little old Derby always had the biggest crowd. No matter when we played in Greenfield, Mass on a Wednesday night, Middletown, Rhode Island, I bet we had more people than they did, certainly in West Haven. But even in Florida, you know, we had a couple hundred people that came down there. Um, a lot of friends um, came down. Parents, it was just, it was it was amazing. You know, I, before we get to the final four, I mentioned Charlie a little bit. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about Jim Mascola because I'm sure during your days of coaching, he played a big part in you know always supporting you and kind of you know being there for you when you needed him. Yeah, Jimmy was um, he he really was was, was one of a kind. Uh, you know. Being the president of, of Pop Warner is, uh, you know, sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, is a pretty thankless job. Right. It's 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, and, uh, but Jimmy, Jimmy just, he loved the kids. Right. You know, um, for the most time, most of the time that he was there, he didn't have a kid in the program. Right. He was just there because he loved it. And, um, you know, he... You know, it was tough. You know, he had to make a lot of unpopular decisions sometimes, and but he knew what he was doing was the right thing, and you know, he stuck to his guns, and um, he was just great for the program. I mean, and he he taught. You know, like Ronnie Slowick took over a few years later, um, and uh, you know, he really mentored Ronnie, and Ronnie did a great job. And then you know, a um, couple other guys had taken over. Tom Abel right had taken over Greg Jenner for a year, but Ron, it, Jimmy set the bar. Right, Set and he implemented a lot of new divisions. Like I said, there was no Mighty Mites. Right. Then I think he had, uh, what was it, Junior Mighty Mites or Junior mm-hmm. Pee Wee's, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And, again, he, like I said, he, he really set the bar, and these guys, you know, Ronnie and Greg and Tom, who have taken over um, for him, just done an amazing job. And now Kathy, Ronnie's, uh, Ronnie's wife, um, she, she's doing a great job this year. But Jimmy set the bar. Jimmy showed us how to run a program and we had the lowest enrollment fee out of anyone. You know, I think right. our enrollment fee was fifty dollars where other towns were charging one fifty and two hundred or, or, or more. And our kids had the best equipment too. Right. You know, yeah. we did a great job with our concession stands. We had the concession stand open up at practice, which a lot of towns don't do that. So you you're you know you're getting a couple hundred dollars every single night. Right. And that helped to defray the, the costs and uh but um, yeah, Jimmy was just—he was an amazing guy. Right. So now, let's talk about the final four. First off, were you were you guys able to get a practice out there at all, or was that kind of hard? No, we were. They um, right. it was very regimented. You know, when we got there, um, we were allowed to have. They they told us when we were having practice. Right. They have a, a special field for us, and um, so our time slot was you know from whatever time. And uh, so no, we were able to get a, a practice in then. Right, and that had to be cool too, huh? I mean, practicing up, I mean, you know, just being up there, yeah. you know, had to be something awesome for not only the kids, but you as coaches as right, well. Right, right. Going to practice actually kind of brought back a little normalcy to, to the day, you know, because the day was, okay, where are we going today? We're going to the Magic Kingdom, we're going to Epcot, you know, what do we, you know, uh, Magic, uh, the, um, yeah, the other place there, MGM. And uh, so... Going back to practice, like, oh, whew, good, we can put that whistle on and we can right. focus on football now, you know, because otherwise it's, you know, focusing on a whole lot of other non-football uh, stuff that kind of got in the way a little bit sometimes. Right. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the Final Four game was played on a Wednesday night, correct? Or maybe... I, think it was, I think it was a Wednesday, yeah. Right. Yeah, because we had two days off and then played on Saturday, yeah. Right. And if Wednesday. I'm not mistaken, the high school playoffs were going on that week as well. I think uh, that Tuesday night, the playoffs were going on and... You know, then you guys played that Wednesday, yep. and you know, you guys trying to think who was the team you beat again to get to the uh, final. It was uh, Capital City, uh, right. North Carolina. Right. So yeah. talk about playing the team from North Carolina because you have a lot of big kids in that, yeah. you know, state. So talk about what yeah. that was like. It was. It was funny. I remember one first thing I remember about that game is that their uniforms were exactly like the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
Really? So they're big kids, and they come out wearing their black uniforms, the black helmets. It was kind of intimidating. And, um, and again, I kept waiting for us to get, like I said, you know, outclassed, outgunned. And um, so we start the game, and uh, we're all, you know, you know, really nervous about it. And uh, um, so the game starts, and, and they have this running back, number seven. And um, after a few plays, he went about 80 yards and – he outran Mark Tilke by about twenty yards. Wow! And I that's and when, not many that's people when it hit, did that. That's when yeah. it hit me. I'm like, we are in for a long day. I mean, this kid was just crazy fast. No one even came close to him. And um, but uh, as it turned out, that would be the only touchdown they scored the whole game. Right. You know, <laughs> that says a lot about that defense. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they did shoot themselves in the foot a lot. They had about five turnovers. Right. You know, but. Um, but yeah, I was, I, I was pretty sure that the night was, o- the season was over at that point. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. So now you guys, you, you go on to win the game. Now you're going to play for the Super Bowl. you know, I believe national championship as well. So, I mean, talk about just winning that game alone and you know, you're in the championship game. I mean, what were you feeling like at that time? I mean, it had to be fun. I mean, were you able to enjoy it? We did. We did. Um, it was, um, I mean, the end of that Capital City game was just, it was crazy. Um, you know, we didn't win it until at the last minute. Right. Um, they fumbled on the one-yard line. Right. And we were able to get it and score. And um, I remember the crowd going crazy. I remember, I remember hugging my dad after the game. And, and, you know, I think that was the, at that point, and I remember, and I, I, it, I remember getting a, a phone call from one of the newspapers and it was probably the first time I had ever doubted us about being outclassed. And I said, I remember saying, "We're we're going to win the whole thing." Yes, I remember that. Yep, we're going to win it all. Yep. Yeah. And um, um, you know, at that point, we felt like you know maybe something special is going to happen. You know, somebody's looking over us or something. And so yeah, so it, it you know it was exciting. But I remember the the day of that game. I mean, I couldn't breathe. Right. Yeah, you know, we were all waiting for the the bus and everything, and I remember just I remember being leaning over on a fence by the pool, and I was I literally could not breathe. I was so, you know, just so wound up tight. Right. Yeah. So you know, talk about the day of that game, and um, let me ask you this. I mean, unfortunately, you guys would lose that game that day, but. Mm-hmm. I mean, would you look at one of the things Coach Desenzo used to always say is sometimes you just got to tip your cap to the other team and sometimes they're better. I mean, would you just chalk it up to that, that you just ran into a team that was better? Because I don't think it had anything to do with the kids not being ready to play. Oh, yeah, no. They, um, uh, I mean, Elgin, Illinois is a town of, you know, I think it was a town of like 2 million, you know, playing little old 13,000 population derby. Um and they were big. I mean, they were huge. They they were they had a full offense and a full defense. They had thirty five kids on the team, right? Um, so we were definitely you know up against it. But our, our kids, you know, um, you know, you're right about tipping the cap. But even to this day, I, I think you know that we we, we could have won that game, right? Um, you you know, know, it was it was it was zero zero at halftime. Yeah, it was a good game, and you know the worst part about it is. You know, and I'm sure you had people tell you this story is we were misled because on the news they had said Derby won. And I will never forget this that uh now I'm not gonna mention the person, but he was giving an Ansonia person a tough time saying, Have your class S championship because we have a national championship and we were all pumped. <laughs> and then <laughs> you find out that the score was wrong. So I mean, yeah. right there that 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 was tough to take as well, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's still um I think I was telling you the story about the. Uh, um, you you when, called your wife. I had to call my yeah. wife. Yeah. So I was always, you know, crying wolf after the Danbury game and the Middletown game. I would come home and she'd be like, How'd you do? And I'd be like, Well, yeah, we won. You know, so <laughs> she'd be like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Then I'm like, No, no, we won. We won. So so she, I was always playing jokes on her. So so right after the Super Bowl, we had to go to the right, right to the airport. Right. And there was a snowstorm in Connecticut, so we got delayed a little bit. So I, um, so I had to call her and tell her to be delayed. And you know, she answers 
the phone. She hears it's me. She's like, congratulations. I'm like, what? And she goes, I'm so proud of you, this and that. I'm like, uh, we lost. She goes, yeah, 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 I know, I know. She goes, she goes How, is everybody so happy? I'm like, honey, we lost. <laughs> <laughs> right. It took a little while to convince her, you know. And then I remember going to the high school and Oak, uh, John Oko, he had said to me, he called Charlie and said, hey, the kids are winning, you know. So it's tough to even hear that, even yeah, to yeah. Remember, you know, recollect about that now. Yeah, I don't know how they messed that up, but... You know, yeah. one of the things is when you lose a game like that, it's hard to listen to people say, you know, you guys have nothing to be ashamed about. But, you know, it really was a great team. But this was the first year you guys had had heartbreak. I mean, talk to me, like, what what did you say to the kids after the game? Were you Did you really even say anything or you just kind of said, you know what, let them be? Now's not the time to, you know, talk to them about a loss. Or yeah, like- it, it really was um- – there was not a whole lot said after the game. Um, right. You know, they presented us with the, the, the national runner-up trophy. And, um, you know, there, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a whole... I was an emotional wreck Right. Um, after that game. All the emotions just poured out. And uh, um, so I, I, I could barely speak. And, um, and, you know, it was tough because we got to get rushed right to the airport. Right. So there wasn't hardly even time to you know, talk much, you know, so, you know, cause we had to get out of there and catch a flight, you know? Right. So it, um, it was, it was tough. Um, right. Yeah. And you come back though, you know, and they have a parade for you guys and just talk about that a little bit. I mean, mm-hmm. were you able to enjoy that parade or was the loss still on your mind? No, at that point, once, once we, you know, once we got home and everything, um, you know, it was just celebration time. It was, right. yeah, yeah. We, no one was dwelling on it. Um, you know, um, it, it was just a time, you know, they said that the city threw the parade for us and had a great, you know, um, we had two banquets and a couple other things. Um, we got to go to the Walter Camp luncheon. Oh, wow. You know, nice. um, they presented us with a plaque. And uh, so it, it was great. Yeah. So, no, it was. No one, even today, no one really talks about that game. Right. You know? No, I mean, it was just a great season. I mean, it was mm-hmm. a great ride. And, you know, there's really, nobody likes to lose, but there's really no shame in losing, you know, if you're going to lose. It, it was the Super Bowl. At least it was, you know, you're playing a team that you know nothing about. And, I right. mean, they have some big kids in that state, you know. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they did. And um, and and as it turned out, we found out that they had scouted us. They They had seen us play against... Um, you know, um, Capital City, and I remember thinking, just, we I didn't know we could scout them, you know. Right. So they, but they had a scouted pretty well, but um, yeah, it was you know, it's just a, you know, um, again, we weren't weren't dwelling on the loss anymore. We were just you know, just enjoying the moment. Right you know? now, let me ask you: Were you drained after that season? I mean, was it? Did you think you could come back the next year and coach again, or did you think to yourself, you know what, maybe I need a year off? I'm so you know tired and yeah, no, I I, I couldn't wait to get back at it. Um, the only thing I was you know um, had to put a stop to right away was, you know, people started talking about, you know, are you going to go to Florida again? And I said, look, I, I don't even want to hear that talk. You know, that, that was this is probably a once in a lifetime thing, right? Yeah. So I don't even want to hear that 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 talk. You know. Because everybody was going to be gunning for us, right? They said we are now, and you lost a lot up. of players too. You lost Mark Tilke, oh, yeah. you lost Drew oh, yeah. back, like yeah. you lost. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. I Jeff, think we only Jeff, had... I think was back, or Mm-mm. he was gone. No, we um, we lost almost that entire team right. that year because some of them were eighth graders. Right, they went on to play freshmen. Right, so I mean, you know, you didn't have your whole team back. You right. know, so now it's a new team, brand new team. You know, so it's kind of unfair to kind of even. You know, exactly. expect that out and, of you guys. Yeah, and, and I didn't want to put that kind of pressure on the kids. I didn't want right. any, I didn't want anybody putting pressure on the kids like that because it wasn't you know it's not fair. It's you know it's a brand you're right. It's a brand new team. It's a brand new season. Now we're the hunted ones. You know everybody says oh, that's the team that went to Florida. You know we're going to get them this year. So we were circled on everybody's calendar. So you know I I put a stop to that right away. Right. <laughs> talk, yeah. So now, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a couple years ago. They kind of had a reunion with that team, kind of celebrated them again. 
Talk to me about the fact that you coach these kids when they were 11, 12, and 13 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them are like pushing 30. I mean, what was that like for you? It was it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it was a 20 year, 20th Anniver year anniversary. And right. uh, so we coordinated uh, you know, a little get together um, with the kids and their parents. Right. Because um, I said the parents were just, they were unbelievable. And um, and we had a good showing. Um, a couple of kids who lived out of state couldn't make it. Unfortunately, Jeff Boyle, he couldn't make it. He lives in Florida. Right. But we had a good showing. And, um, you know, it was it was like we had just been together yesterday, you know, because do, I do see a lot of the kids, um, you know, pretty often. I see Mark, obviously, all the time. I mean, children right. are like family for me. Um, but it was... Uh, it was fun. We played the video. We had I have a highlight tape that I had made that year, and we played that, and um, you know played some other the one of the dads had videotaped everything, so he had all the TV interviews recorded. Oh, so we wow. got to watch that. I hadn't seen that in a long, long time, and you know we just reminisced about you know just a, a, the great time that we had and how unbelievable it was, and you know um, just a once in a lifetime. And it's got to be really rewarding for you because, you know, that's the most important thing is you want to feel like, you know, you're doing something positive in life. And I mean, mm -hmm. you know, coaching high school is the same way. The kids definitely look up to the coaches, but these are young little kids and you kind of make an impression on them forever because basically you're like a mentor, not just a coach. So, I mean, it had to be very rewarding for you. It is. It, it's, um, I don't think... Unless you've done it, I don't think you can um, really appreciate it. It's to me, it it's really is addicting. It's um, I, just, I loved working with the kids, and the fact that I see these kids now and those you know, like David and Roman, who's he's got to be forty one or two years old. Yeah, yeah. He still calls me coach. Right. You know, and we're almost you know I'm just I'm only a little older than he is, so it it, it makes me feel good. Um, you know, and I. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was um, just watching the kids grow, like I said, you know, is, is right. so much worth it. And you're right. In high school, it's a little bit different. When they're little kids, though, they're really like sponges, you know, and right. um, they really do look look up to you. And, you know, and, and I, I always viewed it as an opportunity to, you know, that maybe I, I definitely had coaches who made a difference in my life. I had great coaches right, like Charlie and, and, and D and, you know, a bunch of other ones, but I also had some bad coaches too, who also taught me what not to do, right? As coaches and coaching all those years in Pop Warner, I've seen some other towns and how they coached, and that they also taught me what what not, what not to do, right? And, uh, you know, so I always viewed it as you know, here's my chance, maybe maybe I can make a difference with some of these kids, you know, um, and uh, it's you know. Some of them didn't have fathers, brothers, didn't have good home life. And I always just viewed it as, you know, I, maybe I'm making a difference, you know. Right. Um, and I always tried to, you know, just be there for them and, and push them to be, to be great, not only on the field but off the field. Um, tutored kids when I needed to. And, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an experience that I can never repay. Right. Never. Right. You know, Dan, um, a couple of years ago, you stepped away mainly because your son's getting older now and you mm -hmm. kind of want to, yep. you know, be able to watch him and stuff. But is there a point? Number one, do you still miss it? I do. And, you know, and I, I miss the kids. Right. I, I, don't, I don't miss the grind, you know, because it's every night, you know, it's, a, it's right. a lot of work. It's right, you know. Many, it's right from many, coming from yeah, work after working you know, all day. You're, you're yeah. going to work early in the morning and I'm not getting home until late at night. And... um it, um, but I miss the kids, you know, right. I miss, I miss the kids like this group that's in high school now, you know, I, I think I coached up to the sophomore team and then that's it. You know, Tommy Abel's a sophomore, right. he was on my last team. And, um, so after that, I don't know any of the kids really. So, you know, it's always nice watching the kids on the, on the Friday night, knowing that, you know, right. coach them and, you know, I had a good bond with them, but, um, I, I, I do miss it. I do miss it. I do miss it a lot, actually. <laughs> I do. I'm I'm getting itchy. Right. Now, let me ask you, when your son gets out of high school, do you think at some capacity you'll go back to it? I might. Yeah. I might. Um, we'll see. Um, 
my I my knee surgery has kept me out actually more right. longer than I thought it would. Um, but we'll see. I, I you know um, I I like to do something in some capacity. But yeah, not till he's not till he's done. You know. Right. So. Well, you know, Dan. I mean, think about your derby career. I mean, it's pretty unique because how many people could say they won a state championship as a player and then 10 years later they win another championship as a coach. I mean, basically a good majority of your life going back to, I think you played Pop Warner when you were in seventh grade or eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So you're talking from 1982 till about 2013. That's, you know, 31 years of derby football yeah. that has basically been your whole life. And yeah. I mean, to be able to do this stuff, I mean, you, you just got to look at it and, you know, say that maybe you'll do other things in life, but nothing could trade those memories, especially winning as a player and then winning with these young sixth, seventh and eighth graders. It's got to be, you know, one of the highlights of your life. Yeah. You know, when I, when I tell people that I've coached for so long and, for free never right. got paid a, a, a dime and what they don't understand is that as i was i said earlier i i could never repay what the town has done for me i could never repay that right. i know i put a lot of volunteer hours in coaching but um i've had so many so many great things have happened in my life because of derby football um that's how i met my wife Right. She used to babysit one of the kids on my football team. That's how I met her. Um, that's how I got my job at the bank. Three of the moms that I used to, of kids I coached, worked at the bank. And when they found out I was interviewing, they called my district manager and says, you, you got to hire Dan. So uh, it's helped me in my career. Right. Um, and, you know, and then again, um, the, the, the whole 95 experience, uh, what the town did for us, um, uh, monetarily, just, you know, just how they supported us. Um, and again, I, I can never, I can never put a price on that experience right? and, and what it's, what it's meant. And like I said, I, I could never repay that ever. Right. And you know, Dan, um, just want to say, I mean, that 95 team was a special team. I mean, like I said, that town needed something positive to happen, you know, Derby was on a little losing streak and everybody was starting to panic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what you guys did for that town that year, those kids going out there, you know, and just giving it their all, you know, I really do congratulate you guys. And you guys deserve all the accolades for, you know, what you did that year. That was a remarkable season. Yeah, it's 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 funny. It's like, you know, even 20 something years later, we're still talking about it. Right. You know, that that's how much of an impact it, 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 it made. And um for people, you know, the, the memories that we had um, that throughout that whole season, just some great, great memories. Um, ones that you know, when I look at, even when I watch the, the highlight tape, just I spot something new each time, you know. Right. And um, it was really just it was it was amazing. Um, the town was just was just great. Well, I really want to thank you for coming on today. It was an honor and I really do appreciate it. It's been my pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very and, much. You know, just. To update some people, you know, you're going to hear more about that team probably sometime in the spring because we're going to have Dan and probably a couple of the players on the TV show, and they're going to talk all about that. You know, it'll be a two-part thing, so stay tuned for that. That'll be on Hometown Heroes. Also, you know, as far as Dan Shea goes, you know, never mind the coach that he is, but just talk about the person he is. You know, gave his time for 25 years, never got paid because he just loved working with kids. He loved the town of Derby. And today, you know, in 2016, Dan is part of a very successful Hall of Fame that we started in Derby, and he gives his time all the time so, you know, we could do the best to honor the great athletes of Derby. So, you know, Dan Shea is a great human being, and I really appreciate him being on today. I'm Mike Kenichi saying goodbye, everyone.